To God be the glory for the many things that he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. We honor God, our Heavenly Father, his Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who hung for six hours one Friday and died until death died. Three days later, he came out of the grave, not as a weakling, but with all power in his hands. Fifty days later, he sent the Holy Ghost to reside and preside on the inside of us. And what a joy it is for us to know that we're not just his creation, but we're his children. And after all we've been through, we still have our right minds. But he will keep you in perfect peace as you keep your mind stayed on him. We honor this opportunity to worship Jesus Christ here at the Luke Church. And let me say happy birthday to the Luke Church. Amen. Amen. Thank God that he has raised this church up to be a beacon light in this community for the glory of God and for the good of humanity. And we praise God for your dynamic dynamic leadership and the person of my friend and brother Pastor Tim Sloan come on church thank God for him amen we honor his wife Lady Sloan in her absence hey, come on give it up for the first lady amen we praise God for this worship experience for those of you that are in the sanctuary uh, and in the virtual sanctuary, we praise God for you as well. Can y'all help me give God praise for this music ministry that is just on us? Amen. Amen. Thank God for them uh, in Jesus' name. My time is limited, so let's get to the word of the Lord. I would that you would grab your Bibles, and I want to summon your senses and invite your intellect the book of Psalm, Psalm number 27. If you could give me some more in the monitors here on the pulpit, that would be great. Thank you so much. Psalm number 27. And it is there that the Holy Spirit has highlighted for us. This context of scripture beginning with verse number one. Your Bible should read, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. The host should encamp against me. My heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple I want to tag this text medicine for fear you may be seated in the Lord's church Dr. John Westfall wrote a book entitled getting past what you'll never get over and in the book, Dr. Westfall cited that fear is a response to a perceived threat. Whether the threat is real or imagined. If the threat is real, then fear serves as a defense mechanism 
that will lead to your protection. If the threat is imagined, then fear serves to make you stay still and or regress from any progress you're making. Whether it's real or imagined, fear will kick in. Now let me be very clear to tell you that there is nothing wrong with fear. God has given us the mechanism of fear, but not the spirit of fear. <clears throat> to fear is to be human. But we want real fear and not fear that rules us. So when fear, when, when the threat is imagined or real, Fear will do one of two things. It will serve to protect us or it will serve to paralyze us. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is not the threat. The problem is how you perceive it. Uh, the, the, the perception of the threat determines the effects of fear. I'll say it again. The perception of the threat determines the effects of fear. More often than not, the threat is not the problem. It's how you see it. And ladies and gentlemen, many of us would be honest and admit that there are some things that scared us that we found out later wasn't even real. Because your perception of the threat determines the effects of the fear. And on the other hand, some of us found out that some things that was intended to scare us didn't come close to scaring us because it is your perception of the threat that determines the effects of fear. What we find here in Psalm 27 was a documented time in David's life where he had to wrestle and respond to his own fear. And the beautiful thing about Psalm 27 is that Psalm 27 is David's response to how he tackled fear through a conversation he had with himself. This Psalm is written in first person and the author is the audience. Uh, it's, it's interesting, church, that this is not a dialogue. This is a monologue in which David's strength is seen, one, in his ability to encourage himself through the lyrics of this psalm. But from the history of the psalm, most scholars think that this psalm is speculative at best. And then there are others who suggest that this psalm was written during a time that David was fleeing for his life from the murderous jealousy of Saul. Uh, Saul had become insecure with the favor, the attention, the approval that David had amassed from the nation subsequent to his victory over Goliath. Saul made him the enemy of the state. Saul made him uh, a fugitive on the run. And he, while he is running, he has been displaced 
from his family, from the house of God, from his community, all for the sake of trying to spare his own life. In the context of him sparing his own life, he was on the run as a musician and also a king in process. And thus he spoke to his own spirit through the gift of music documented in these lyrics that are tucked away in the Hebrew hymn book known as the Psalms. This is actually a song that is used for scripture. And he speaks to himself. And this is powerful, church. It's almost oxymoronic, Pastor Sloan, <clears throat> that David had to address his own fears from the threats of Saul. And, and what's oxymoronic about that, Pastor, is that anytime somebody threatens you, they're the one scared of you. People threaten you because they're scared of you. It really ought to have been Saul addressing his fear, but it was really David who had to speak to his fears predominantly because the threat now had outnumbered David. Uh, when we read this text, he's dealing with the wicked enemies and foes. The threat is plural. And thus he has to speak to himself and watch his medicine for us. He gives us medicine for fear, church, because the thing that he teaches us in this text, this is the sermon in a sentence, it's really this. Your fears will succumb to your revelations of God. That's... that's that's really the sermon in a sentence. Your fears will succumb to your revelations concerning God. Let me see if I can help these people over here. Your, your fears will succumb to your revelations concerning God. No, they didn't get it. Let me see if we can help these people here. Your fears will succumb to your revelations concerning God. Your fears will succumb. Your revelations concerning God. If you have no revelations of God, you will be scared. But if you got some kind of revelation about God, your fears will succumb to your revelations concerning God. Because God did not give you the spirit of fear but of love power and a sound mind and anytime you get scared here is your medicine y'all ready the Lord is my light <laughs> and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life. I, I'm trying to suggest, church, when we look at this passage, uh, Pastor Sloan, uh, from an exegetical perspective, David's in introduction is a conclusion. He really should have started with verse 3 and 4 and ended with the Lord is my life. But he started the introduction with the conclusion. I've got some conclusions about God. As a result, I ain't scared of what's happening to me. I I'll try it again over here. I've got some resolutions about God. Therefore, fear is put in its proper place. Can we walk through his resolutions about God? First thing this text is tailored to teach us church is about our concentration on God. He says three things about God. Y'all don't mind we, we walk through this passage, do you? He said the first thing, the first thing about God is God is my light. The second thing he says, he's my salvation. And the third thing he says, he's my strength. The Lord is the strength of my life. 
house. God is my light. Uh, when we see that word in scripture, it is referring to knowledge, information, intelligence, enlightenment, that God is the revelation of what I need to know about him. That's why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That Jesus is the revelation of God. That all that we need to know about God from a divine perspective is tucked away in Jesus. And if he is light, he dispels darkness. The Lord is my light, which means he provides direction through dark times. The Lord is my light. He provides direction through dark times. Guess what else he says about God? The Lord is my salvation. Now this salvation in this Old Testament text is not soteriological. It is not relative to eternity and the, particularly the salvation of the soul. It is relative uh, existentially to real life, real time. He says that God is my salvation not just because he saved my soul. He saved me from some real life drama. Uh, your, your salvation isn't just eternal it's existential that you ain't just waiting on the sweet by and by it's some stuff happening right here in the earth that God is saving you from if he's light he's given direction through darkness if he is salvation y'all he is giving deliverance through difficulties the Lord is my light given direction. The Lord is my salvation given deliverance. And then he says the Lord is my strength. Hebrew word there means a fortified place or a safe house. The Lord is my strength, which means he's my defense in danger. Y'all still ain't feeling me, so let me talk to these people here. Catch it. The Lord is my light to give direction. He's my salvation to give deliverance. And he's my strength to give defense. The Lord is my direction, my deliverance, and my defense. The Lord is my direction through darkness, my, my deliverance through difficulties, and my defense through danger. The Lord is my direction my deliverance and my defense when somebody is trying to attack me he defends me if i get in trouble he delivers me if i'm in darkness he gives me direction whom shall i fear <laughs> you, you missed all that uh, the lord is my direction he's my defense and he's my deliverance now who am i scared of again Y'all missed it. If I got the right revelation of God, it would reduce my fear. They don't know how to get happy. The bigger you make your fears, the smaller you make God. But the bigger you make God, the smaller you make your fears. And if you learn how to have right revelation about God, there'll be less stuff you'll be scared of. He says the reduction or removal of your fear is built on your revelations concerning God. That's why you can't afford to come to church and play in Sunday morning and miss Bible study. You need some revelation about God. That's why you got to come to small groups. You need revelation about God. That's why when you walk in church on Sunday morning, you need to be serious about getting the word of God so you can have revelation about God because you're going to need some stuff in the world that's going to scare you. And you got to look at it and say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it, so let me help you. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Sloan, he says, since the Lord is my light, salvation, and strength, 
Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Well, when we read that passage, we might think he's talking about somebody. And in some context, he probably is, given the historicity of the passage. But it's powerful, church, that if you make God bigger, it literally says fear is being reduced to an unanswerable interrogative. I can't get no help. He says if you got the right revelation about God, fear becomes an unanswerable question. Oh, I can't get no help here. He says if, if you got an answer to this question, whatever that is, is bigger than God. And since there's nothing that's bigger than God, this is an unanswerable question. So don't even try to scare me. I don't play like that. I got God on my side. Don't even try to scare me. I don't play like that. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Don't play me. I'm not scared like that. God is on my side. He says the bigger you make God, fear becomes an unanswerable question and it robs fear of having a life and personality. Whom shall I fear? Y'all got to learn to read the Bible slow. Whom shall I fear? There is no name or person to put behind this question because if we do, now they're bigger than God. And there is nobody that's bigger than God. Do not fear him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy the body and the soul. There is nobody bigger than God. He says, if you're going to have medicine for fear, you got to concentrate on God. you got to have the right revelation about God. The bigger you make God, the smaller you make your fears. That's why you got to learn how to magnify him. <laughs> I can't get no help here. Some of y'all been in this church now for an hour and a half. You've been sitting there like you at a funeral. You haven't opened your mouth. You haven't lifted your hands. You haven't said, Lord, I thank you. Because it might be something you're scared of. But if you learn how to magnify him and make his name bigger, your fears will become smaller. Concentration on God. He says, if you got the right concentration on God, now you can have the right conservation by God. I'm in verse, verse 2 and 3. Here's what he says. Uh, he says, now, since I'm out here on the run, I'm making God bigger. And it, it must be noted, Walker, that making God bigger means more outside of church. than it does inside the church. Because uh, that's where the enemy's wickets and foes. Lord, I can't get no help here. Uh, uh, out there trying to come upon you to eat of your flesh. It is the picture, church, of a wild predator that pounces on its prey. He said there are those who have uh, got together to consume me. Have y'all noticed the wicked enemies and foes? Have y'all noticed that they got together to do something bad, but they can't get together to do something good? It's always interesting to me how people unify over bad purposes. We got to beg you to unify over good purposes, but you willingly unify over bad purposes. As a matter of fact, the wicked enemies and foes have one common enemy. David. But when we read this passage, we are subconsciously led to think that wicked enemies and foes are the same people. Y'all got a Bible? They are not the same people. They have three different identities with three different words. As a matter of fact, if you got a Bible and can read it, 
Here's how it really reads. When the wicked and mine enemies and my foes. David doesn't claim the wicked. He says the enemies and the foes. They belong to me. I got something to do with them. The wicked are just generally bad. But the enemies and the foes, let me talk to you about them. Y'all ready? Now, if this box checks you, you just say amen. If it don't check you, I'll get to you in a minute. The wicked, ladies and gentlemen, are those who oppose divine goodness. They are bad for the thrill of being bad. You don't have to do anything to wicked people in order for them to do something against you. They get drunk off of seeing people hurt and struggling and in pain and in danger. They get excited about being evil because they are literally demonic. That's the wicked. They oppose divine goodness. David says, I don't have no claim to them. But my enemies, uh, I, my, my enemies, I can claim them because your enemies are people who oppose God's goodness in your life. Because they know reasons why you shouldn't have what you have. See, your enemies are people who grieve the goodness of God in your life because they know reasons why God shouldn't have blessed you, why he shouldn't have gifted you, why he shouldn't have gave you the house you got, why you shouldn't have the oil you got because they know stuff about you that you act like you forgot. I can't get no real help in here. And they are envious of God's favor on your life. That's your enemies. They oppose God's goodness in your life. But not your foes. The wicked are bad for the sake of being bad. Your enemies are bad because God is good to you. But your foes are people you have wronged. See, you spiritual people want to act like everybody your problem and you ain't never wronged nobody. You've never cussed nobody out. You've never done something you regret it. Let me talk to some real people who testify with all the Holy Ghost I got, with all the tongue I got, with all the scripture I know. I've done some wrong to people. Church folk kill me like everybody wrong in you just because you saved and sanctified. No, you've done some stuff to people. The wicked don't like good. The enemies don't like me. And my foes, I've done wrong to them. They sound synonymous, but they're three different groups. And David says they've teamed up on me because I'm in a season of my oil. Oh, I can't get no help here. They teamed up on me because the oil is on my life to be Israel's next king. And because the oil is on me, there is organized stuff against me. The funny part about it is, y'all, I didn't know the wicked, my enemies and foes even knew each other. I thought y'all, I didn't know y'all even knew each other. It's interesting how the enemy, the, the adversary knows how to organize people at a time you want to come up. They have come upon me to eat of my flesh. Pastor, I'm about to run right here. But they stumbled.
That ain't the shout, Walker. They didn't just stumble. They fell. Y'all don't know how to shout. Some people stumbled and got back up. But this text says when they fell, when they stumbled, they failed. They didn't get back up to recover their purpose. Somebody ought to thank God that people who really was against you had every reason to be against you, but they stumbled and I'm trying to see if I can put some theology to this. Because when we read the text, David gives no cause for the effect. He said they stumbled and failed. He doesn't say what caused them to stumble and fall. He says they stumbled and failed. He said, I don't even know what happened. I just know they were en route to me. They had got together and had a meeting on me. And they were making their way on my trail and all I can tell you is they stumbled and failed the stumbling stopped their progress the fall stopped their purpose so it suggests Pastor Sloan that while they were en route to me something came up y'all don't know how to get happy since I don't know why they failed Whatever they tripped over was something they didn't see coming while they were en route to me. And here is the theology, y'all. It means that the unseen caused something un unforeseen to stop that which is seen. I got rewind in my mind over here. It means the unseen cause something unforeseen to stop that which is seen it means the unseen cause something unforeseen to stop that which is seen the unseen God brought up unforeseen circumstances to stop the seen enemies from coming in your life isn't it crazy how God got the power to just let stuff come up at the right time, in front of the right people, at the right moment, you don't know how he did it. Something just came up. Y'all don't know how to get happy. That's how every weapon formed against you didn't prosper, cause something came up. That's why people ain't killed you yet, cause something came up. Somebody thank God the unseen caused the unforeseen to stop that which is seen. I quit. I quit. Thank y'all for letting me share this little Easter speech. We got to quit. We got another service. But just tell somebody, neighbor, I ain't scared now. Because God got a way to bring up some unforeseen circumstances to cause some stuff that was trying to take me out to stumble and fall. And as a result, I will dwell. on every soul standing in this place today. 
Listen, the pathway is clear. There's nothing holding you back from beginning a brand new journey. Today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ and you're saying, I want to get it right, today the pathway has been made clear. God, I handle the stuff you can't even see. Now the responsibility is yours. Won't you come right now and say, I just want to make sure that I got a solid relationship. And I promise you're not going to be by yourself. There's some today who are saying, I need a place where I can grow. I need a place where I can become a part of a community of faith. We want to walk with you. We want to be a part of that journey. We want to be able to see the great things unfold in your life. And together we'll do it. If you're here today and you don't have a church home, today is your day. This is your moment. This is your hour. You've been thinking about it. You've been talking about it. Come on. If you got family, say, come on, let's do this today. It's anniversary Sunday. Come on, won't you come? Come on. They did it. They did it, and so can you. Come on, you can do it. Confess them with your mouth. put your hands together let's celebrate God in this place now come on help me celebrate today these who have come come on let's get real happy and excited in here today so grateful for the decision you made we never take it lightly we're grateful that God has led you to this moment and grateful he trusts us to be a part of the journey we don't know everything but here's the one thing we're clear about more in front of us than it is behind us and it's better when we walk into it together. On behalf of these incredible folk behind me, those amazing folk in front of me, and online, we want to tell you, God bless you today. Won't you follow our deacon? Come on, one more time. Help me praise God. Listen, have y'all been blessed in here today? Let me praise God for the preaching gift of Bastard Tolan Morgan. So grateful today. And help me celebrate this choir on their release. Yeah, oh, taste and see. There's so much more to come on that. But do me a big favor. Make sure that you're posting that, letting the world know on social media about this new single. And let's celebrate with the Luke Church Choir and Michael Dixon. And the greatest pastor of worship arts in the whole world, Dr. Chad Brawley, the genius behind all of this. I got more to say about that, but we're so grateful for him. Listen, we're getting ready to go. Two quick things. Listen, I want you to make sure that you register to vote. If you haven't registered to vote, I need you to do so. Uh, we've got our Greek ministry and our social justice ministry outside in the foyer. They're helping to register new voters. I think we've registered well over 30 or, or 40, maybe more than that. 58 new uh, voters uh, and since we've started. And listen, if, if you haven't, go to vote. Dot gov to check your registration status. Please, this I don't want to say it all, but this is so imperative. Go check your voter registration status. Don't wait until November and find out where your polling place is. We found out ours for the first time in 20 years is 18 miles away. So you need to make sure that you check where your polling status is. Amen? 
again today, I'm grateful for our Harris County attorney and our future Harris County attorney, Christian Menifee. So incredibly grateful for him and also for Chantier, who is running also uh, for our district attorney. Y'all help me celebrate them. Listen, we're a nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse any candidates. But you need to know who I really like. <laughs> so Pastor William Lawson used to tell me, Tim, make sure that the church knows who you really like. So I really like Christian Menifee, and I like Sean Dier, and I'm grateful for their great work for this city. Amen? Don't forget y'all got brunch before you get out of here today. I hope you'll stop and grab something before you leave. Now unto him who is able to keep you and I from falling and present us faultless before his presence of glory with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said together, amen. God bless y'all. Happy anniversary. Be careful on your way out. Do you know